disciples and allies, our fathers made many campaigns both within and without Europe, and the elder men among us here are not without experience in war. Yet we have never set out with a larger force than the present, and if our numbers and efficiency are remarkable, so also is the power of the state against which we march. We ought not then to show ourselves inferior to our ancestors, or unequal to our own reputation. For the hopes and attention of all the world are bent upon the present effort, and its sympathy is with the enemy of the hated tyrants. Therefore, numerous as the invading army may appear to be, and certain as some may think it that our adversary will not meet us in the field, this is no sort of justification for the least negligence upon the march, but the officers and men of each particular city should always be prepared for the advent of danger in their own quarters. The course of war cannot be foreseen, and its attacks are generally dictated by the impulse of the moment, and where overweening self-confidence has despised preparation, the wise apprehension often been able to make head against superior numbers. Not that confidence is out of place in an army of invasion, but in an enemy's country it should also be accompanied by the precautions of apprehension. Troops will by this combination be best inspired for dealing a blow, and best secured against receiving one. In the present instance, the city against which we are going, far from being so impotent for defense, is on the contrary most excellently equipped at all points, so that we have every reason to expect that they will take the field against us, and that if they have not set out already before we are there, they will certainly do so when they see us in their territory wasting and destroying their property. For men are always exasperated at suffering injuries to which they are not accustomed, and on seeing them inflicted before their very eyes, and where least inclined for reflection, rush with the greatest heat to action. The tyrants are the very people of all others to do this, as they aspire to rule the rest of the world, and are more in the habit of invading and ravaging their neighbor's territory, than of seeing their own treated in the like fashion. Considering, therefore, the power of the state against which we are marching, and the greatness of the reputation which, according to the event, we shall win or lose for our ancestors and ourselves. Remember as you follow where you may be led to regard discipline and vigilance as of first importance, and to obey with alacrity the orders transmitted to you, as nothing contributes so much to the credit and safety of an army as the union of large bodies by a single discipline. There is justice, prospective allies, in what you say, if you act up to your words. According to the grant of the patriots, continue to be independent yourselves, and join in freeing those of your fellow countrymen who, after sharing in the perils of that period, joined in the oaths to you, and are now subject to the tyrants, for it is to free them and the rest that all this provision and war have been made. I could wish that you would share our labors and abide by the oaths yourselves, if this is impossible, do what we have already required of you remain neutral, enjoying your own, join neither side, but receive both as friends, neither as allies for the war. With this we shall be satisfied. Ye leaders and heroes of the prospective allies, be my witnesses that not as aggressors originally, nor until these have first departed from the common oath, do we invade the land in which our fathers offered you their prayers, before defeating the overlords, and which you made auspicious to the world's arms, nor shall we be aggressors in the measures to which we may then resort, after we have made many fair proposals but have not been successful. Graciously accord that those who were the first to offend may be punished for it and that vengeance may be attained by those who would righteously inflict it.